Welcome to today's NHP live webinar on enhanced protection of your people and assets focusing on earth leakage devices. My name is Jamie Goddard and I am the product manager for power distribution products including today's focus topic earth leakage devices. I hope you've had a chance to review the on-demand webinar on earth leakage and earth fault fundamentals part one that was released last week. On the bottom of the screen are various icons of which you toggle on and off various screens. Please use the Q&A icon slash section located on your webinar screen to submit any questions. We'll be happy to address those at the conclusion of the webinar. This is just one in a series of webinars created to showcase NHP smart devices powered by smart distribution and embedding smart safety into operational processes providing our customers with better visibility into processes, data and analytics. Let's now begin. Today we are going to show ways to make your switchboard smarter covering correct selection of earth leakage devices. What is an AFDD and its basic operation? Work health and safety RCD compliance requirements and advanced RCD testing. Here are some definitions of the different protection devices. MCB, miniature circuit breaker. An RCCB, or an RCD, also known as a safety switch, uh, is a residual current operated circuit breaker without integral overcurrent protection. Or an RCBO, or an MCB, RCD, or a combo unit. It's a residual current operated circuit breaker with integral overcurrent protection. Knowing the big difference between RCCB and RCBO, one is without overcurrent protection and one is with overcurrent protection. And then of course we have earth leakage relays, technically called a MRCD. It's an earth leakage relay or a modular residual current device without integral current braiding. Though it's generally used with a circuit breaker because it doesn't actually break the circuit itself. And AFDDs are fault detection devices which we'll cover a bit more in detail later. Here are some typical examples of the different protection devices. As you can see, then, see, they all come in all different shapes and sizes. MCBs typically range from a 9mm width to 27mm width per pole. Most common is 18mm. Your RCCB, most common in 2 pole, 36mm, or 4 pole, 72mm width. RCBOs are much more wide ranging, coming in from 18mm width. Uh, standard regular MCB size through to three polar neutral or even with add-on modules that make up the total width up to 90 mil wide. Earth leakage relays are a combination of a relay and a toroid that are separate and used to control a circuit breaker. Or an AFDD which is fairly new. As you can see they all look a bit different uh, in different configurations. And now we've seen examples of each of the devices. So what protection do they offer? MCBs, as you can see, offer overload, short circuit, and have integrated circuit breaking built into the device. They don't offer earth leakage or art fault detection. An RCCB is purely for earth leakage protection, but it all does also does have integrated circuit breaking, so it does isolate the supply. An RCBO, a lot more green smiley faces here, it offers overload, short circuit, earth leakage and in integrated circuit breaking. So both the function of an MCB and an RCCB. Earth leakage relay, a few red rounds here. It's purely de designed to monitor and detect earth leakages and work with other devices to isolate the device. So it doesn't have integrated circuit breaking. And the NHP AFDD has all green smiley faces throughout. It offers because it's coupled with an RCBO, so it offers overload, short circuit, earth leakage, art fault detection, and integrated circuit braking. RCCB types and applications. Types of RCCBs. We'll start with the type AC. It's designed to operate with sinusoidal residual currents, which occur suddenly or slowly rising in magnitude. These are the most common types used for light and power in Australia. 
Then we have type A or type AI. They too operate on sinusoidal residual currents, but also as well as pulsating direct currents which occur suddenly or slowly rise in magnitude. These are the general requirements for light and power in New Zealand. They're also recommended for rectified loads such as switch mode power supplies, power tools and motor speed controllers. Type F, less common, work as per the type A but are in addition are capable of detecting composite residual currents and pulsating direct currents. Single phase inverters such as washing machines, dishwashers and building drives are the applications that it's targeted for. Becoming more common are type FB devices. As per type F, in addition they are capable of detecting residual currents up to 1000 Hz and smooth DZ residual currents. Good for three phase inverter circuits, drives, UPS, battery chargers. For electric vehicles you'll see more and more type B devices. So here you can see four most common types, most common being type AC, type A increasing in popularity and, and type B also. It's important that the waveform of the pole current is considered as per the wiring rules, clause 2.6.2.2.1 for those who want specifics for the correct RCD selection. For example, if you had a load that may produce uh, under fault conditions a pulsating direct current leakage to earth it was protected by a type AC device, the RCD wouldn't see this leakage and could potentially expose personnel to a lethal situation. And so that's why it's important to choose because if you had a DC residual current and you didn't have a type B device, type AC, type A or type F probably wouldn't operate and it could expose the personnel to a lethal condition. Uh, uh, due to the more complex loads today, type A and type B devices are becoming more and more common. There's actually a standard providing guidance on the correct selection of RCDs, and it's IEC 60755 Annex B. Product selection of RCBOs. Remember the eight golden questions to selecting the right RCBO for your needs. Number of poles, how many is it? One, two, three, or four pole? Is a switch neutral required? The current rating, is it 10 amps, 16 amps, 20 amps? Trip sensitivity, 10 milliamp for medical or higher risk or standard 30 milliamp. The RCD type, as we touched on in the previous slide, is it a type AC, type A, type B? The voltage in the network, is it 240 volt or is it a mining application that might be 110 volt? What's the minimum braking capacity? Is it a 6K device, 10K device? The curve type, is it a B curve or most common C curve for general light and power or a D curve? And the brand, does it fit in the enclosure? And when you say does it fit, has it been tested by the manufacturer to ensure it's safe? Just because something physically fits doesn't mean it fits. Many tests have been performed by different manufacturers to ensure the system is safe, which includes short circuit, temperature rise, and it doesn't physically stress the bus bus system. So brand selection is, is correct. Putting different brands on different uh, bus bus systems can prove to be dangerous. For RCCB selection, some of these steps can be bypassed. Just a reminder what the RCDs are designed to detect. Earth leakage currents to earth to provide personnel protection or to help with plant and equipment fire protection. For earth leakage devices to operate, there must be a path to earth to create an imbalance, which I'll explain in more detail in the next slide. Here's an example of an RCD operation in a normal situation. Most RCDs have a toroid. Through the toroid, your line conductor, your active and your neutral conductor. Each of these conductors produce a magnetic field in a particular direction, IA and IN. The magnetic field's magnitude is MA and MN. In a normal situation, MA cancel at MN and they, so no current is induced into the toroid.
in an abnormal situation or an earth leakage situation, the magnetic fields are not balanced. MA is greater than MN because there's a return path via the Earth circuit. Current flow being IE. So these are not balanced and a current is induced into the toroid, triggering the sensing circuit to trip out. These are the big differences between the RCD operations between a normal situation and an earth leakage situation. Most important bit is that all active or line conductors are passed through the toroid. So if it's a three wire or a four wire system, that would be all phases plus neutral. If there was no neutral, it would be just the three phases. Just what goes in must come out. In an earth leakage situation, there's an alternate path where some current is flowing via the earth return. A relative new device to our market is an arc fault detection device, also called an AFDD. This works slightly different to an earth leakage device as they monitor the waveform to detect a series of parallel arc faults. An earth leakage device may not pick up these types of faults, and we'll provide a demonstration a bit later on how they perform differently. With the NHP Mod 6 AFDD, you're provided with a very High level protection as the AFDD is coupled to a standard compact RCBO. Provides overcurrent, short circuit, earth leakage, series and parallel arc fault and over voltage protection. Here's some examples of different arcing faults resulting from damaged insulation, vermin damaged cables, loose connections. Pierced cables such as inside the walls, people drilling into the walls. Trapped cables in doorways or under materials. Or aged cables or UV damage cables are just some examples of arc how arcing faults can initiate. RCBOs have proven themselves over time as valuable level of protection. But let's have a look at how an AFD can complement this by looking at this demonstration video. A window should automatically pop up, otherwise you may need to click on the media play button. That was a pretty cool video showing the basic AFDD operation. I hope you found it useful. Now, 
do you really need to use an AFDD? Here's a summarised version out of the wiring rules 2018. In Australia on the left, they may be used, which probably means it's a good idea. Do you really want to wait until it becomes mandatory? Do you want to upsell and offer it now? Here are some following applications where they may be used in the bullet points on the left, such as sleeping accommodations, high risk fire locations, or locations with endangered of irreplaceable goods such as museums. In New Zealand, however, when the 2018 version of the wiring rules gets mandated, they must be used as per the applications listed on the right hand side. Let's now talk about workplace health and safety requirements in regards to earth leakage devices. RCD product standards, like the four listed below, do not specify ongoing safety testing inspection requirements for RCDs. 3190, 61009, 61008 and 60947. Wiring rules ASNZS 3000 does require verification as per section 8 on periodic inspection of testing of the general installation which doesn't really talk specifically about RCDs or the operation of the RCD upon install which can be by the test button or by special equipment. There's a current exemption if testing is not required, if supply is not available, but in the next amendment of the wiring rules that is being removed to ensure the RCDs are functional when installed. Different states are covered under different workplace health and safety legislation, but all states excluding Victoria have adopted the model WHS rules covering RCD requirements and regular testing. Work Health and Safety Regulations 2017. It comes under Division 6 in Residual Current Devices. Note 164, the use of socket outlets in hostile environments. It specifies what hostile environments are such as conditions that are likely to result in damage to the equipment or reduction in the equipment expected lifespan. It may include conditions that involve exposure to moisture, heat, vibration, mechanical damage, corrosive chemicals or dust. Or damage to equipment or to a flexible electricity supply cord is reasonably likely. Or it's moved frequently in its normal use. In those applications you must use an RCD supplying socket outlets to minimise the risk. And the RCD must not exceed 30 milliamps per socket outlet, not exceeding 20 amps. 165 states testing of residual current devices and they must be regularly tested and operating effectively. What is regularly tested? We'll talk about that soon. And it must keep records of the testing until the device is next tested or it's removed from use. If not, uh, penalties apply for all of the above. Australian standard ASNZS 3760 is the standard that provides in-service safety inspection and testing of electrical equipment. This standard provides guidance on what is regularly depending upon the application. Also included on Table 3, it states the maximum trip times. And Table 4, it provides guidance on intervals between the testing, depending on the application, if a push button or operating test time is required. Also defines that a type AC test for operating time is acceptable for both type AC or a type A device as the DC calibration is linked to the AC calibration. Australian and New Zealand standard 3760 is the standard for in-service and safety inspection and testing of electrical equipment. Here we can see an extract out of it of table 4 showing the type of test and the frequency between the tests. You see in the yellow columns is push button test by user, in the light blue columns on the right hand side operating time and push button test. And working on the far right hand column we can see factories recommendation is 12 month intervals between the operating time and push button test where further down on row 4 it's a two year interval. Some site requirements may require much more frequent tests uh, but this is an extract out of the 3760 standard. Now let's talk about RCD testing solutions to help make our switchboards that little bit smarter. 
traditional testing methods of RCDs. You have your RCD tester, you plug it into the socket outlet. It's a little bit time consuming. There's a lot of site downtime because you're running between the socket outlets and the switchboard to switch the RCD back on. It is a bit safer, but how do you test the lights? There's no outlet to plug your RCD in for testing the lights. Or you could do it at the switchboard. It's a lot quicker than at the socket outlet. Site downtime is it's a still a bit slow because you're working in a live environment. You require an observer. It's much higher risk. You're hoping that the board doesn't see a fault while you're working in it because you don't want to be exposed to arc flash. So it is, it's a little bit higher risk, but a little bit quicker than the traditional method using a socket outlet. Some advanced ways to perform RCD testing is a cam switch solution, which enables testing to occur with all the switch gear behind the escutcheon. You plug your tester into the test point and use the traditional RCD tester as per normal, operating the selector switch to select the desired RCD to be tested. The board would need to be pre-configured for this system to work, uh, but it is a much safer system and, and been used in the market today. The more advanced RCD testing system is the rapid test system. What is rapid test? It's a Wi-Fi based rapid RCD testing system. It allows testing of all the RCDs to perform quickly in a safe environment. All live parts are behind the escutcheon. Personnel are not exposed to live circuits. There's reduced risks for electrocution or exposure to arc flash. It's also much quicker. Time is money. Testing downtime or power off is reduced from minutes to seconds per RCD. It takes about five seconds a circuit. These are a lot of security options too. The local Wi-Fi only, so point to point. It's password protected. There's a lockout switch option. And it times out after 20 minutes, then you need to wake the unit up. The solution can be integrated into the switchboard or retrofitted into an enclosure next to it. You can see on the right hand side of the image, it's got the system installed into the board when the board was constructed. On the left, bottom left hand corner, is some retrofit kits where it was uh, retrofitted beside the switchboard and then you just run a circuit from each RCD to the rapid test unit. And then it can be controlled by a tablet or an iPad or a Windows 10 PC. So very quick and easy to do testing. With the rapid test system, there are a number of tests you can do while using the system. You can do zero degree, 180 degree and 100% sensitivity. You can do a half trip to make sure the device doesn't trip at zero point or 180 degree on the waveform. Or you can do a five times test, which is a fast trip on zero point or 180 degree. You can also unable to test because it may be locked out, tagged out, maybe performing maintenance downstream, or you may fail the unit visually. You can also decide to test one RCD on one of the channels, or you can test them all They're very quick. So you can just enable all the circuits and test the whole board within a minute or two against traditional methods, which takes a lot longer. No need for an observer because you are not working in a live environment. So the co compliance requirements. So on completion, the rapid test system outputs standard PDF for proof of actual testing on site. It removes the possible lack of proof when performing manual push button testing. Simplified reporting by recording the site details, the test date, the next test date, the tester, test trip time, and if it passed or failed, as you can see from this example here. Very easy to complete the test and mail it just by pressing a button on your tablet. And HP have a number of selection tools available, such as this RCD chart, which has some frequently asked questions on the left hand side, talking about typical residual leakage currents of certain devices, what the earth reference is, what the definitions between the type AC, a type A, a type F, and a type B RCDs. And of course, all the different configurations 
that NHP have to offer for RCBOs. Look out for our other future webinars on other ways to make your switchboard smarter, including transfer switches, energy metering and integration, safe ground surge protection, and Arclogix protection. Here's an example of how they are all configured inside an NHP concept. If you haven't already, be sure to watch the on-demand webinar on Earth Leakage and Earth Fault, which goes into more technical detail. This was released last week. Thank you for joining us for this webinar. I hope you found it beneficial. And if you'd like to watch it again, a recording will be sent to you via email and will also be uploaded to the NHP YouTube channel. To find more webinars in this series, simply click the button in the Call to Action section on your screen, which will take you to our website or visit our YouTube channel. A short survey will also pop up on your screen once the webinar concludes. We'd be grateful if you could take five minutes to provide your feedback. If you have any further questions about enhanced protection of your people and assets, part one, earth leakage devices, please contact your local NHP sales representative. I'm now able to answer any questions that you may have or sent during presentations. Well, Jamie, fantastic, uh, fantastic presentation there. Thank you very much for that. Uh, very informative and very detailed uh, to all of our all of our listeners today. Uh, this is Steve Young speaking to you all uh, on the uh, the uh, technical uh, training leader for power distribution at NHP. Um, thanks, Jamie. Uh, you on the line there? We've got a number of uh, questions that we're able to uh, we're able to tap into now to ask. Uh, are you yes. with us? Yes, Steve. Oh, I'm, okay. I'm here. Um, I'd just like to address one topic. There was a looking at some of the questions, some of the people had issues watching the video. As, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, a link will be sent out for a YouTube link so you can look at it later and you'll be able to look at the video if, for those who had trouble seeing the video clip of the AFD operation, which was pretty cool. And now I'll address some of the other questions that we've had here. Okay, um, so let's, uh, let's you there? You got you got a, you got those questions on there, have you? Yeah, I've got a question here. Is the AFDD suitable for final sub sub circuits, e.g., 20 amps? So the AFDD is great, the NHP one, because it connects us to a regular RCBO, the M6 RCBD, the two pole, two screw unit, 80 mil width. So you can connect it to a, a 10 amp, 16 amp, 20 amp, 32 amp RCBO. Um, so you can use it directly for final sub-circuits, or alternatively, like like uh, we used to do with earth leakage devices, you could connect it to a 32 amp RCBO, then connect it to say 10, uh, three sorry, three 10 amp um, sub-circuits, regular breakers downstream, or two 16 ampers um, downstream, or even two 20 ampers, but uh, you've got to be careful about your maximum demand there. So it's possible to do it the old way or the preferred way to maximise your level of protection and limit your nuisance tripping is by using one for each final sub-circuit. So you could do it either way. Terrific. Thanks. There was another question here. Wayne, how many RCDs can be connected to one rapid test kit? So we do have a few different rapid test units available. We have a, a combo unit, which is a master and has eight channels built in, or we just have a master. And the combo unit can be connected up to uh, up to 10, uh, well, up to nine channel units, or just the primary master can be connected up to 10 channel units. And each channel unit can control up to 24 RCDs, or test 24 RCDs. So if you use the standard master with 10 channel units, uh, you could con effectively uh, test up to 240 RCBOs or RCDs. With a combo unit, it's a little bit less, but still more than 200. So more than, more than enough for any application. There's also another question here about rapid test using Wi-Fi. How is that secure? So the, the rapid test doesn't actually use your business Wi-Fi. It actually uses point-to-point, -point. so you don't need to. So it's only as, as 
the range is only as good as the Wi-Fi connection from point to point from your tablet or your Windows 10 PC or your iPad to the rapid test master unit. And there's also security with password protected as well as having a lockable key switch. So there are a number of steps to help make sure it's secure and it goes to sleep after, after 20 minutes and you need to manually wake it up. Okay, so uh, are there any more questions here? We have a number. We've got uh, we've got a whole heap of questions that have come in. Unfortunately, we're not going to have the opportunity and the time to uh, to answer those uh, in this in this presentation in this webcast. However, what we will do is we'll take all of your we've got all of your email addresses there for those of you who have uh, have registered and uh, we'll take this off our feed and we will answer all of your questions directly, I think, via email. I think that's the best bet because there are so many uh, so many questions coming on the back end of there. Jamie, what do you think? Is that, that okay? Yes, yeah, so yeah, look out for your responses. We'll get onto them as soon as we can. Hopefully we can respond to them within the next half an hour. And, uh, and yeah, thanks for your time for listening to us today and, and I hope you refer back to our video references and tune in to our other webinars for our other exciting talking topics coming up and uh, please hang on uh, and uh, fill out the uh, the the, um, the survey at the end of this thanks very much for your attendance everybody and have a have a great day stay safe and uh, we'll look out for you the next time cheers cheers